Yeah. Awesome. Well, welcome everybody to the Genius Brewing live stream. This is a live stream we do absolutely every Sunday, no exceptions, at 8.45 Pacific Standard Time, a.m., on the dot, never late. You know, never late. We always do it. Whether you see it or not, uh, we do it. Yeah, we're, we're live somewhere. Hey, that's uh, a weird then. truck full of random crap that's running through our parking lot. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh are you serious? You asshole. I'm sorry for the TikTok world, but this jerk of a truck just tailgate down, full of crap, cut the wrong way through our parking lot. We have like a one way only entrance because it's right by a light. So he went the wrong way out of it and just dumped a whole bunch of garbage out there because he's a jerk. Yeah. In more positive Genus Brain news, we did get new XLR cables, so that's hopefully going to uh, be leading into why we are sounding better this week. And uh, one of the reasons that we've had some issues getting on every single Sunday uh, has been because of the XLR cables um, that we were using, um, giving us some technical difficulties. So we yeah. got new XLR cables, which means our live streams should be super, super succulent. And that's a good word for that. Crispy. Crispy. Succulent. Uh, in other news, we also got new lav mics for our videos. Yeah. So we can do some uh, nice other non-live stream videos and maybe even some some chick pops maybe maybe even some chick pops i mean you know and then not have to have these nice beautiful things in our face the whole time yeah or figure out where we're going to set them up in the plethora of crap around here that's true we do have a plethora of crap yay not as much crap as was in the back of that guy's oh truck my God. but that was just like at least put your tailgate out man yeah i mean that's one of those like i wish i was outside and probably would have thrown a rock at his truck maybe or at least there were some kids out there to throw a rock at his truck, although it might have improved it. Yeah, that's true. Um, last week when we were not here, my son, Lachlan, turned eight. So uh, happy birthday to Lachlan if you happen to be watching. Belated so. I mean, I, I, wish, I wish him birthday. Happy birthday on the day. but Yeah, you, you, know. you, you did. And I mean, I did too. Not there, but I did it because Allison remembered that it was his birthday. And we're like, oh, yeah, yeah. happy birthday, Lachlan. But now it's on the Internet, which makes it real. It does make it real. And now a whole bunch of internet strangers can wish him happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. Uh, end of the year inventory. That's a, bar, a big part of what's been uh, on our to-do list is to count a bunch of stuff. We got all the hops counted yesterday, and um, we're pretty on pretty good track to be all the way done with inventory before the new year. So, Which is uh, awesome because normally we spend the new year in here doing inventory, which, you know, is something that uh, – we will probably at least do again that will not at all involve early morning drinking. Yeah, never, ever, ever has it. All all day drinking is not but a thing that's ever it's, happened. It's not a thing, and we will mm -hmm. definitely be counting things here in here on New Year's Day, like stroke penalties. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, that's, a, that's awesome for everybody. We're, we're not going to have to do that. We got some deep cleaning to be done, too, so we might have, yeah. uh, we'll have, we'll have worked we'll on have New Year's Day, no matter what. Really. If anyone wants to come help volunteer, maybe uh, you know, we'll, we'll bring some pizza or something like that. And there's beer. And, the, and there's beer. Uh, no Drop Brewing Company soft opened yesterday. Um, that's a small part of my hangover that I am currently battling. Um, yeah. But yeah, they, they soft opened. They are a German influenced uh, um, brewery in the Spokane Valley on 16th and uh, 16th and University. Yeah. Yeah. 16th and University. One of yeah. That sounds right. So go check them out. Uh, I did not get to go yesterday because we were taking my daughter to go get pictures with Santa, which also at important. least like last year, she didn't cry, but she definitely <laughs> didn't want to sit next to Santa and gave him some of her famous stink eyes, which I, I, I mean, they're Those legendary. always make for good pictures, though. Yeah. And there's a few good pictures of her just going... <laughs> And you're like, I don't even know where you got that face, but it's adorable and I'm keeping it. That way it can embarrass you later in your life. So, yeah, uh, also reminded me, you know, like what is it, what is the difference between a uh, hippo and a zippo? One's one's a little bit lighter. One's a little lighter. One's heavy and the other's a little lighter. Ah, you're so close. You uh, missed yeah. the first part. You missed the first part. Ah, uh, speaking right. of going to No Drop, if you guys end up going to No Drop Brewing Company, uh, just use coupon code Genus Brewing at, at checkout, and that's good for 100% off all your beers. So make sure when you go there and visit, just after you buy several, several beers, say, I'm going to use co coupon code Genus Brewing, and then they'll give you free beer. And that's 100% true and not a fallacy at all. <laughs> I don't know why anybody would ever accuse us of that. Yeah, we've never lied before. 
ever, especially not on the internet. Well, I think that's pretty that, much it for all our happen. Genus Brewing news. Which means it's right. time for our, our beer, beer of the week. Bum, 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 beer of the week. week. Yeah. yeah. Nailed you it. We need some jingle bells for that one, actually. Jingle bell. Maybe we need to come someday. up with a, we need to come up with like a musical track to go with that. Like when you get the, um, the like how, that we can yeah, just, like, exactly. Press buttons. Uh, CH super annoying with. from Homebrew for Life has one of those sound bars, and you can just like plug it in and be like, boom, and add some jingle bells and all the different sounds. Uh, today's Beer of the Week, we're talking about a Dunkel's Bach, which, uh, you know, a lot of the German styles in the BJCP handbooks in 2015 kind of renamed, and so there's some crossovers. Uh, I think a couple weeks ago, months ago, we did the Helles Bach, which is kind of like the new... My Bach, it's got a crossover for My Bach, but could be lighter, mm. you know, so there's... I, I don't know that I would quite count Helles Bach and My Bach the same. To me, there's a little bit of a difference in those. Yeah. Uh, and, but, and BJCP, though, you know how like they like to categorize everything, so it's... Yeah. Anyways, well, now we're talking about Dunkel's Bach, which is a slightly baby version of a Doppelbach. Uh, it's still a relatively big beer in the uh, in the German beer world. Um, overall impression of a Helles Bach is a dark, strong, malty lager beer that emphasizes the malty richness and somewhat toasty qualities of continental malts without being sweet to the finish. And by now, you guys should know part of part of why. Uh, also, by Helles Bach, he means Dunkel's Bach. You were talking about Helles Bach, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, now we're talking about Dunkel's Bach. Plus, I yeah. also just wanted to say Dunkel, because it's a fun word. Dunkles. Dunkel. Dunkel's Bach. Uh, um, so yeah, yeah, we're talking about the uh, we're talking about the Dunkelsbach now, and that was the overall impression. Uh, uh, basically, you're looking at one of the bigger versions of a German style beer that's still, I would say, well, I'm not sessionable. It's uh, uh, it's in the Bach yeah. world, which always gonna get it's gonna make it a richer beer, uh, but without but. getting like super super dark or super super um, heavy and sweet. Yeah, uh, and I I mean this uh. Unlike some of the other box, what's uh, interesting to note on there is the somewhat toasty qualities that go into this one that m probably are not in the doppel or the single box in that. And in Dunkel, you get that little bit of toasty note that you get out of most Dunkels, which uh, is delicious. Yeah. Appearance on this is going to be light copper brown, uh, or light copper to brown color. Now, if we're going exact SRM, you're looking at 14, which is actually, I mean, that's getting into the amber-ish brown realm, um, uh, and then all the way to 22 SRM, which it can actually be pretty dang dark, like getting into porter realm. Yeah. Um, so uh, often with attractive garnet highlights, lagering should provide good clarity uh, despite the dark color. Um, with most German beers, it's going to be the case outside of wheat beers. You're looking for some semblance of clarity, especially in the German lager world, all mm. the box. Um, so it should be pretty clear. Uh, and then a large, creamy, persistent off-white head. Yeah. All right. Uh, Patrick Sandy, is the stream fuzzy because of a technical issue or because of a, uh, a uh, drought issue? Uh, there's a screen. Oh, yeah. There's a screen it's, fuzzy, yeah. It's definitely Damon's fault. I mean, it does look kind of fuzzy. It's fuzzy on my phone, but usually that just means that I'm not streaming at high enough quality. We should be yeah. sending We should be sending through in 1080. Hopefully. So hopefully we're looking not super fuzzy on some people's ends um i know at the very beginning some people were saying uh um that we were looking good uh, so it could be something to do with the number of people on the stream could be something to do with the stream quality hopefully youtube is still recording this at the highest possible quality so for those of you watching back at home and for those of you listening in on the podcast hopefully we look really good because you know yeah. as we've always said tim's got a perfect face for radio yeah i do actually it's quite nice for radio so I've been told. <laughs> Matt right, says please. it's not fuzzy on his end, which I'm going to take as a win. Uh, yeah, probably just, you know, local streaming quality uh, or just local sensor quality to make us look better. We they, they blur the lines a little bit. Yeah, exactly. It's like the pretty right. face filter, but but you know, <laughs> but poor <laughs> quality. <laughs> it's a poor, poor man's pretty face filter. It's a genusified filter. There we go. <laughs> Flavor, complex, rich maltiness is dominated by the toasty, rich Maillard products. Some caramel notes may be present. Hot bitterness is generally only high enough to support the malt flavors, allowing a bit of sweetness to linger on the finish. Well attenuated, not cloying, clean fermentation profile. Although the malt can provide a slight dark fruit character, no hot flavor, no roasted or burnt character. 
And uh, a lot of this is, uh, goes back to something I think we've, think we've talked about in most of our last several live streams. I feel like we've done German beers a lot for our live streams. Because they're tasty. Damon's having some influence on us. Uh, well, I, you know, he's asking a lot of questions, which gets us thinking about it. Yeah. Um, well, well, and uh, the reason that I'm bringing this up is because I'm trying to tell you uh, these rich multi notes don't come from crystal malts. They come from process. They come from, uh, you know, they can come from somewhat more complex notes, but uh, often you're not even using like special B or something like that. Um, and if you are using it in a relatively small quantity, uh, but you're doing a lot of process to help build these characters instead of just relying 100% on uh, malts to do it for you. Uh, and beers like this, you're also usually starting with a darker base malt, which which accounts for a good chunk of the color. So there shouldn't need to be a lot of color corrections, even coming from things like roasted malts. You can leave those out. Just rely on process to help build character. It even says in the first sentence, Maillard products. You're trying to achieve a lot of those Maillard reactions to get that richness, to get that uh, carameliness coming out of it, not crystal malts and not even a mellow malt or a melanoidin malt mm -hmm. a lot of times that's used to mimic the maillard reaction and it mimics it a mimic is not perfect eventually it's going to come alive and eat you especially if it's a carpet yeah uh, that don't trust carpets never uh, do yeah but i mean that's that's why i go for no carpet for me personally but, you know <laughs> uh, i yeah, think that uh, went yeah. somewhere else anyway <laughs> Uh, you're not don't mimic it do it right do the actual process right and not getting into the overly roasted although most dunkels uh, are approaching you know the roasted notes in there this shouldn't be overly roasted have some toast in there the toast is good but not the roast I have long since forgotten most of that D&D &D campaign I uh, know but the, the mimic that was a rug was that's going to be with me for life yeah I mean mostly just because of our reaction to rugs from then on out yeah like hey, let's not do hey there's a rug there's let's a rug. burn we shoot it, it first <laughs> Uh, anyways, yeah, so back to the Maillard. We love Maillard because Maillard is the kingliest of all the ducks, so try to um, get it in your beer. Yeah, and using all the processes, and like Peter was saying, use using a more rich base malt, you know, something like a Munich or a Vienna. Yeah, and never be afraid to decoct. Mm, never be afraid to I think decoct. it's fun to do. I mean, you can always decoct, like, during a, a normal mash. Like, let's say you do a 40, minute, uh, 40 minutes of your mash, and you got another 20 minutes, and you're like, eh, let's do a mash out. If you've got like a, you know, even a small amount of that can help add some depth of character. And especially mm -hmm. at a beer like this where you can add so much fullness uh, to this style of beer, I think it's a fun thing to do. Just pull off a chunk of your mash, toss it in a, you know, a pan on your stove, a clean pot or something like that. Um, get it cooking. Get it actually doing some of those, uh, um, those Maillard brownings, a small bit of caramelization, uh, and then toss that right back in. There's a lot of uh, character that you can fill in this style of beer. So adding that extra level of effort uh, can really help... Uh, enrich your beer 100 percent. and this is a beer that something like that should be done i think there's a few beers you can get away with not decocting and you may or may not notice a difference traditional goza was decocted but if you have a well attenuated yeast you may not notice the difference in something in a bock if you don't do something like that, you are going to notice a difference. You you got to get that Maillard in there somewhere, and when you do it in a decoction, it's it's wonderful. Oh yeah, I mean it provides so many delicious characters. It's a lot of extra work, but you know what? It tastes better, so do it, please. Do it. Uh, Mouthfeel medium to medium full body. These are uh, richer beers. Uh, moderate to moderately low carbonation. Um, so I like to keep mine on the medium. Uh, you know, medium is kind of a standard for me on all German beers. And some German beers, like half of Weizen, can go up to that high range. Um, of course, obviously, like Saisons and uh, Sours can get in there, that high range too. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, some alcohol warmth is going to be present because these can be relatively high alcohol. And... Um, should never be hot, so it shouldn't be uh, sh fusely at all. You want a nice low and slow fermentation, as is typical of you know lager fermentation. Uh, smooth without harshness or astringency. Let's talk a about a couple things specifically in there. Now, um, your final gravity can be as low as 1013, which is on the slightly full side, and as high as 1019, 1 1.019. Uh, and 1.019 is going to start to feel rich in the palate. You're going to get some residual... Um, you know, semi longer chain sugars that are still left in there, uh, and those are going to um, 
uh, those are going to add to that body. And then when we're talking about uh, how to get good uh, alcohol presence without it being hot. Um, Tim's going to talk about taking care of your yeast because that's going to be very important for the style of beer. It is going to be extremely important for the style of beer. Uh, and for most lagers, yeast health is going to be something that... Oh, yeah, go on. Forgot to unplug one thing here. Uh, yeast health is going to be something that's extremely important. We always preach some yeast health, but especially in lagers, because you're getting that slower fermentation, doing it at lower temperatures, and you want it to be so clean and smooth, you do need to make sure that you have enough proper healthy yeast to do that. One of the biggest things you can do is pitch enough yeast, but even better, have a yeast starter. Yeah. That takes care of the size of the pitch, but also really what it does is it gets your yeast up and fermenting. Uh, and that's an important thing. It cuts down on the lag time, but the yeast is already woken up. It's already gotten going. It's ready to go and munch some sugars. Get some of that some. Munch that sugars. But... Uh, you can just pitch a couple of extra yeast packets as well to get the proper uh, yeast cell count if you don't have a way to do a yeast starter or a way to do a clean healthy yeast starter because that is also important uh, on it also doing proper temperatures on this it's one of those things that loggers uh, everybody thinks oh you just throw it at a cold temperature and then you leave it alone and yeah, not really you need to be doing your proper temperature rest on there one of them that's extremely important is your vdk rest uh, some people call it a DMS rest or things Diacetyl like that. rest. Diacetyl. Well, whatever. I'm sorry. I had a dms -y beer last night, and it's just in my head. Cream Stuck corn. Stuck in the head. Well, I didn't have it. My wife had it. I was drinking the uh, J.W. Lee's uh, Harvest Ale. Oh, that's so good. Port uh, cask aged. I think it was from 2018 or so. Oh, oh nice. So good. Uh, over at I'm, the filling station. Nice. I, I miss getting some J.W. Lee's. Oh, man. Wife, yeah. if you're still watching, should we go to the filling station later today? Oh, because that sounds delicious. Oh, there's a uh, bigger, badder Baptista from Epic. Ooh. That's uh, coffee, cocoa, vanilla, aged in whiskey and mezcal barrels. I'm down. Mm. It sounds delicious. That's where we were at last night after Santa. Sounds like I'm going to be hungover again tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, one thing anyway. to talk about when it comes to uh, taking care of your yeast in these lager batches uh, is actually uh, because if you're going to be pitching at the proper lager start temperature, like those low 50s, you actually do have an advantage when it comes to oxygenation because oxygen will dissolve in the beer uh, better at those colder temperatures. And so uh, before going into your fermenter, before pitching your yeast, getting down to that full uh, pitch temperature instead of relying on... Um, you know, like going in at 70 and relying on your fridge or whatever to ramp it down. If you can get it down to that cold temperature before pitching, you will have an advantage with oxygenation too. Um, so that's helpful. Uh, yeah, it is. And uh, to go into the uh, DMS rest, the VDK rest, that's basically at the very end of uh, your fermentation. You ramp the temperature up uh, on it. We kind of got distracted by Harvest Ale because it's <laughs> so goddamn delicious. It is tasty. Uh, anyway, uh, so you're ramping up your temperature. You're at your lagering temperatures, wherever that may be for you in particular your yeast that you're using on that. Some of them are lower, some of them are a little higher. Uh, but then you actually ramp it back up into ale temperatures, taking it up, you know, to maybe like 65, even 68. Uh, and then... Uh, one more up. Six, yeah, well, it's always better to go to 69. Uh, if you have the capability. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, ramp it up, let it get warm, and then you're going to have your yeast blowing a lot off a lot of the uh, off flavors that it normally doesn't at the lagering temperatures. That's DMS. It's going to convert that. It's going to get it off. It's going to get it out of your beer. It's also sulfurs, too. When you have a sulfur problem in your lagers, it just can't degas. The sulfur is going to come out of it at that point as well. So. Yeah, super helpful. So do your rests after fermentation is nearing completion. Uh, Frazzle Penguin, welcome back. We have been on every single Sunday, so you've missed a ton. We haven't missed a si we we haven't missed a single week. Uh, Jimmy J, is it a good style to make a starter beer first and then pitch on a cake? Uh, actually, yes. I'd love the idea of doing like a Munich Helles first. Um, or, uh, you know, any sort of light lager, but anything you're like steer clear of hoppy beers is kind of a general rule when it comes to doing a starter beer. Um, yeah. but yeah, with a big healthy pitch, I think this is a great beer candidate to make a lighter. Someone's at the door. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. We're getting some mail. 
Uh, I'm going to kind of scroll through and get caught up a little bit on some comments because I know there's some questions that we missed before we finish off the beer uh, stuff. Um, Adam Chumbly, he's been on every Sunday that we haven't, which is zero of them. Um, sorry that we missed each other. Um, <laughs> Ledgerill89, uh, they don't, every Sunday they don't show my abandonment issues surface. Uh, yeah, well, you know what? We did show, and you get, we you guys just didn't pay attention hard enough. Does you have it? to believe harder. I don't know. It says Genus Brewing Swag, so we're going to live open it. Unboxing video. Uh, Pamela Hakala, considering brewing a sake beer hybrid, what should I take into consideration? Or even if I wanted to try brewing straight sake, do you have tips? Uh, I think below there's a follow-up about using koji. Oh, uh, someone asked if she was going to use koji or go straight. And oh, gotcha. She said maybe. I think Koji's part of the flavor development, so if you were to do a hybrid, I think that'd be uh, worth doing. Um, raise your hand if you want one of these. And then go online and buy one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think actually with, if I were doing a sake beer hybrid, my first attempt at it, because I haven't done one, uh, would actually probably be to try to make sake first and then blend. Um, I actually have always wanted to make sake, but I haven't really gotten into it. I know the fundamentals, but I don't know the uh, we, the exact fundamentals. We haven't gotten enough time to be able to do that, which is something that we should do and maybe make a video on. We have some koji here. Yeah. Oh, uh, other video that I wanted to make that the idea popped into my head was uh, doing a coffee seltzer. Mm. Yeah, like well, the, the doing eighth, like you, 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 I told you my strategy a, before a for whole that. Bunch of different ones. If you want to uh, buy this, definitely head over to our website and buy one. This is actually a really nice material. It's like thick cotton. Mm, yeah, I like that one. Um, are we caught up on? Oh, people are commenting on the TVs. Those are relatively new. Um, they're free because there's advertisements on them, but they also show our menu, which is cool. Yeah. Uh, we there's one at the very beginning. Uh, the is kind of a genusified thing. Uh, what's one of the... Oh, man, I got to go way back there because he phrased it. Uh, Ledger 89, what's a flagship beer recipe you've chain, changed, you've made over the years, you've been proud of? Uh, trick question, we don't have flagship beers. No. Uh, Castor Muncher would probably, or Count Chocula, would be what people uh, say is a flagship beer, but let's go over the history of Count Chocula. The first one was a 4.8% uh, 4 session stout. Then the next one was like an eight point nine percent, and uh, then we've kind of fluctuated. They've kind of gone between seven and eleven percent over the last yeah. several batches. Well, they're the always different malt bills, uh, largely dependent on things that we probably are already about to waste because we mess up on a customer customer's recipe or something like that. But yeah, it varied. I think the uh, second one was done in like an American Robust Stout. The third one was a Russian Imperial Stout. Then there was an Oatmeal Stout. Now it's a Sweet Stout. So it, it's not even flagship. The Castor Muncher is close enough, but this is a really good preaching moment right now, so I'm going to step up on uh, Stan's <laughs> soapbox and say you should be changing your flagship recipes every time. Uh, it's something that's that, what makes it fun. Yeah. Well, also that, and if you want to make the same beer every time, you need to be changing your recipe every time. You are dealing with living products as far as yeast goes, but especially hops and malts. Your malts are not always the same. Most people go straight across on everything, and different years, different crops will yield different sets of enzymes, different flavors, different maltsters put different things in. Using Great Western Vienna is going to give you a kind of little bit sweet, fruity, pilsner-ish taste, but using Best Malts Vienna is going to be this really nice biscuity with a great little German fruity undertone to it. It's way different on that. Your hops vary year to year. So if you want to be making the same beer every year, or uh, sorry, every time, you need to be changing your recipe. Your fresh hops, when you get them in September, are going to be way more potent than the hops you're using next July that are almost a year old. They're going to be fading off. So you need to account for that in making the exact same beer every time. So... That's one of the things that we're proud of is we never have a set recipe. We're always changing that to achieve the same beer every time or just do fun stuff with it. 
I would say if there's one thing that was close to a flagship, our uh, hazy IPAs are mm. relatively similar stylistically every time. And the biggest consistent change, I think, is that we use Halcyon for pretty much all of them. Uh, I will honestly say most our, our hazy and our juicy IPAs most of the time the base <clears throat> recipe does not change on that because it's not real uh, to me that's something that's not really important uh, as so much in those beers whether what we're trying to achieve in it is basically a nice fluffy tasty base maximum juicification and, with whatever whatever fun hops we have on hand yeah and then it's just hops galore on top of it and throw them in however they should be thrown in and get flavor out of it you know. So. Um, let's do one more question real quick before jumping back into the rest of the <laughs> rest of the style. <laughs> we got a little bit sidetracked. Yeah, it's all right. Uh, it happens. Pamela Hakala, if uh, I use CBC one yeast for a cask or bottle, uh, cask and bottle conditioning yeast, uh, by adding it to the carboy, do I still need to use priming sugar? Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. I'm also going to do the next question. Uh, Patrick Sandy asks, thoughts on Golden Promise and Brambling Cross Smash? Yeah, that sounds tasty. Do it and send us some. Uh, I would probably yeah. use uh, ESB yeast for it. Anytime you focus on uh, you know, using a quality base malt in the Smash beers, they turn out surprisingly good as long as your process is good. Mm. So if you're a good brewer, I love Golden Promise as a, as a base malt. It's not as good as Halcyon, but it's still pretty good, and it's very flavorful. Um, so you'll get like a little bit of that Marisotter nuttiness in that. Uh, but yeah, anytime you're focusing on it, make sure that you're focusing on process. If your process is good, the beer's going to be good. Uh, all right. <laughs> History. Uh, oh, we got comments. We haven't done comments yet. Oh, well, comment. Oh, no, we haven't done comments yet. We got distracted by swag. Swag. Uh, so comments, decoction, mashing, and uh, long boil plays an important fla part in flavor development. We've already mentioned that. Uh, as it enhances the, car enhances the caramel and Maillard flavor aspect of the malt. Uh, any fruitiness is due to Munich and other specialty malts, not yeast-derived esters, because this is a lager. It is a relatively clean beer. Uh, I will sort of take a little small pullback even in even with german lager beers there's going to be some sort of esterification um, because german yeast typically put out just a small amount of esters it's way different than the warm warming esterification you can get from like an english style beer uh, but I, I like to call it like a small yeast uh, or uh, malt favoring esterification but for sure a lot of the flavor development is going to come from um, just the long boil and or decoction process um, helping build on those malts uh, I will be honest in that, uh, for me, one of the absolute joys that I have in German beer is just the small undertone of green apple that you can find in most of the German lagers uh, out there. I know some people think that it's a brewing flaw, but it's one thing about German beers. It's just so slight and that little bit of tart Christmas uh, on... Christmas, yeah, Christmas. Uh, crispness on the end of most German beers, especially the lighter lagers, is a joy for me. I absolutely and utterly love it, and that is a yeast-derived ester uh, on there. Acetaldehyde or acetaldehyde is uh, acetaldehyde and acetaldehyde are the same compound. They're yeah. just different nomenclatures. Um, history. But I Origi love it. Originated in northern Germany, a uh, city of Einbeck, uh, which was a brewing center and popular exporter in the days of the Hans Hansidic Hansidic Hanseatic League. Hanseatic. Yeah. I say it pompous. <laughs> it's the Hanseatic, Hanseatic League. Uh, 14th to 17th century, uh, recreated in Munich, starting in the 17th century. The name Bach is based on the corruption of the name Einbeck in the Bavarian dialect and uh, was thus only used after the beer came to Munich. Bach also means ram in German so uh, and is often used in logos and advertisements. So, uh, you yeah. know, you should r ram some Bach down your th throat. I like, the, I like the story of, you know, it, it, it's a ram because it rams you in the face when you drink it. Hell yeah. And then, you know, you go, ow, I chipped my tooth because I hit myself in the face with my glass. <laughs> and you feel embarrassed. You feel embarrassed. The characteristic ingredients, Munich and Vienna malts, uh, like I said, said before, large part of the grain bill. You can use some so smaller uh, specialty malts to kind of help build that. But a lot of your coloring, coloration should come from process, that decoction or long boil. Uh, Munich and Vienna malts will build a good, subtle, a, a darker base than, you know, a standard Pilsen or Pale or even Marisada style base malt. So, uh, and uh, German Munich and uh, Vienna malts are typically lighter than American Munich and Vienna's. So you're starting with about a, you know, anywhere between four and seven uh, level bond uh, base. But 
using processes and maybe some smaller uh, specialty malts to kind of help build coloration, but mostly process. Mostly the process. Even in here, it is saying uh, never use any non-malt adjuncts. It's in there. Rarely a tiny bit of dark roasted malts for color adjustment. For color adjustment, not so much flavor. And I will say some of the toastiness that comes out of this beer is actually using some of the toasty Vienna and uh, Munich malts that come from Germany. Great Western, while fantastic malts, and that's a great malt to use for most everything, it will not be as good if, uh, as using some of the uh, German Vienna and Munich on it. I will say, just uh, if you get some local uh, maltsters, they can get some heritage malts. Uh, they'll come in, come in and be quite as delicious. Um, just for me, especially like Best Malts Vienna has a toastiness, a little bit of biscuitiness that isn't there in the Great Western, and it just makes the beer so much better. For myself, uh, continental European hop varieties are used, clean German lager yeast. Uh, one of the reasons for the continental uh, European hop varieties. I would say you could use other hop varieties. Just make sure that they are absolutely clean and have minimal uh, impact on it. Um, you're looking for a little bit of hop bitterness to balance out some of the uh, sweetness that comes out of this beer and not much else added to the character. A little bit of spiciness will be all right, but not much. I think I could probably use Mount Hood in here and be, be pretty, pretty good with it. But nothing fruity. Don't 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 use New Zealand hops. Are we gonna have like copy, copy copyright things? Don't put volume. I'm not gonna put volume. I'm gonna try not put volume. All right. But Katie Wong mentioned that that we she was getting distracted by. Uh... Now he's getting distracted. All right. Now I'm getting distracted. Anyway, so. Uh, you just want to make sure that your hops on there are used to balance out the sweetness for this with very minimal impact. You shouldn't really perceive them at all. And then making sure your uh, German lager yeast is pretty darn clean. I like the Munich strain for this. I think that would be really nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, style comparison, darker uh, with richer multi flavors and less apparent bitterness than a Hellesbach. Less alcohol and multi richness than a Doppelbach. Stronger malt flavors and higher alcohol than a Marzen. Uh, richer, less attenuated, and less hoppy than a Czech Amber Lager. And of course, all this is available on the BJCP website slash app, which is what I usually use if you guys yeah. want to look into it more. Yeah. You know, uh, they got some good points in there. They're good guidelines to get you into a nice range for things. All right. So let's uh, let's let's move on. There's a couple couple of other. Jimmy says. Jay says no Lutra. I mean, oh yeah, actually. I, lo I love Lutra, but at the same time, it's one of those like it's hard to get perfectly right. If you, uh, Lutra would honestly be fine for this beer, uh, there w I wouldn't have a problem using it at all. I would probably then use an extended lagering period just to get more crispness out of it, uh, and it still probably would be mostly right, not quite all the way right. Uh, before going into topic number one, let's answer a couple more comments slash questions. Uh, Fraller Fralor. Just had my first brew in a bag on my brand new Digiboil 65 liter smash. Citrus Maris Otter. Um, it's going to be, I think it's going to turn out great. Uh, yeah, Citra and Maris Otter is, uh, I think that's a, a solid, easy to, to make good winning combination. Um, hopefully you got the, um, the 220 volt on the Digiboil. Because um, otherwise I'm sure that was a very long process. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, Frazzle Penguin, I flew from Winnipeg to Vancouver in September for a family wedding. Uh, I really wanted to st t talk the pilots into making a beer stop in Spokane, but the wife wouldn't let me. That's a shame. Uh, yeah. I think if you just kind of, you know, ignore your wife, charge in, and just take control of the plane in the first place, you can make that happen. And usually the pilots are pretty cool about you just taking over. Um, or you could just DB Cooper right out the back of the plane and drop in on us. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, there are I worse mean. ways to... Make a beer stop. Beer stop. I, you know, I, God, I mean, there was a guy who made, what is it, the most epic beer run in history, and a guy literally snuck his way, he snuck his way onto a military base uh, as, I don't know, an officer or something, 
got onto a plane, flew like all the way, I think it was Vietnam or Korea, one of those, delivered beer to his buddies and made it all the way home and nobody questioned him. Nice. Like, real, the, dude made a beer run to another country to his war buddies. Epic. Absolutely epic. I'd, th- I'd call that a win. Yeah. All right. Uh, so, yeah, if you can do that, Frazzled Penguin, you can just jump out the side of the plane and, you know, come have a beer here. Uh, Bill Definitely. Davenport, similar kind of answer. Hello from the East Coast, Washington, D.C. Heard you guys talk about beer kits you sell. Been wondering where I can pick one up. No, oh, that's a kit. Uh, we used to sell them online. Uh, we probably still could put them back together, but it ended up being more of a hassle to get those out than it was worth. You know, we'd get like maybe two kits a week and they'd, you know, we'd have to ship them out on different days. And that was, you know, putting out together one kit for pretty small um, profit margin didn't make a lot of sense for us. So we stopped putting those online. So we can hook you up if you need. Uh, one of the deals that we actually do is we have all of our beer recipes that we make in house here, uh, as well as all the ones that we create on our brewers friend page. So if you have a local homebrew store, which we encourage buying from your local homebrew store, they need it. Uh, definitely, you know, buy from us cause we need it too, but, uh, your local guys need it. Um, you can get on, get one of our recipes, uh, and then get all of your ingredients from them and. Uh, we at Brewer's Friend is great. It provides instructions for everything. Hit brew it and then hit print instructions and away you go. Uh, or we can send one to you or, you know, message us on Facebook and we can chat a little bit about it. Adam Chumbly. So if I pasteurized some blueberries and threw them into secondary and got busy for, let's say, uh, two months, have I now made a Lambic? Um, mm, not no. unless you added a mixed culture. Uh, if you if you you can turn it into a lambic if you add a mixed culture and then uh, I mean depending on the beer style but you you're also missing a few years yeah uh, to start off with the, one for uh, young three for old yeah um, so if you pasteurize them and threw them in the secondary there shouldn't be any other uh, yeast on there so you just made an extended blueberry beer uh, you pulled more color pulled more tannins out of the blueberries. If you got a wild yeast in there, you created something wild and uh, let it ride and, you know, have it be delicious. Riv, uh, Riv, Riv, Rivera, what's a good German lager to try? What's a good German lager to try? Um, you know, in all honesty, if you have most of the family uh, brewery lagers out there, uh, you, they're available to most people. They export everywhere. Yeah, most of those are going to be good. Wine Stefana, uh, most everything from Wine Stefana is going to be delicious. Uh, Bitburger is delicious. If you're anywhere in the Northwest and you can get a hold of Chuck and Nut, that's going to be one of the best examples you can have. Um, Frame does some really great stuff for that. If you're in the Midwest and you want a one in the in the style of uh, uh, Dunkelsbach, which is w- what we just talked about, then New Glarus has something called Oof de Bach. Uh, New Glarus does a great job too, so that's one that I would trust. Yeah, uh, New Glarus does do a great job as well. Um, Palner, Palner makes some amazing uh, German beers, and in fact, Palner's uh, Marzen is the original Oktoberfest beer. Like that was that was the one that was at the first Oktoberfest. I do not know, or I cannot confirm or deny that. I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty sure. That, I'm pretty sure. Pretty sure. That's what Matt's here for. Yeah. Uh, Frazzle Penguin, thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, I miss you guys. One day I'll make it down and have some beers and chill in the tap room. Prove it. And also let us know ahead of time. And bring beer. And bring beer. Definitely bring beer. Uh, all right. Where, oh, yeah. Blasterized blueberries, good long beers. Oh, yeah. You already did the uh, Augustiner lager. Uh Oh, yeah, this guy's uh, responding to what's also delicious beers. Augustiner Lager. Tagger. Monsieur Spetzal. Yeah, I don't, you know, there's some really great ones out there. Uh, All right. Uh, What's the worst combination of hops hops you've experienced? Hmm, Interesting. It's kind of uh, hard to say that there's a bad one. The biggest thing is when I when we use really big uh, hops. In, I would say it's got to be something like mosaic with spalt or something like that. N- no, you, what I'm actually going to uh, say that's in here, and then I'm going to go into my reasons why, is something like mosaic and or citra with galaxy. Um, 
The reason for that being is that Galaxy will just get so overpowered by any of those big hops in there, you have basically just lost the entire character of that hop. And while it may not be the worst in flavor combinations, with how expensive and delicious Galaxy is, to override it with something like Citra is just the worst. And it's not a good worst like, you know, a Bratwurst or a Bockwurst. It's just the worst. Matthew Lopez, Beth's web stores to source your favorite malts like Special X and Halcyon. Uh, that, we use more beer. I know a lot of people have been going back to Northern Brewer now that they're not uh, AB InBev owned, but uh, I, don't, I don't have a lot of experience with Northern Brewer, and from what I've seen, they seem to be a little bit on the higher price point, but again, I haven't checked in. not trying to naysay them, um, but we've just used more beer because they are... Uh, uh, um, they have a wholesaler that's one of our vendors too, and so we're pretty familiar with their book and all their prices mm -hmm. seem to be pretty well in line. Plus, they have a lot of uh, um, uh, contracts that they're kind of building their own uh, their own brand lines, working with uh, other major um, non-U.S. peoples to have their own brand lines. Um, things like the Comos uh, uh, kegerator systems and jockey boxes, things like uh, the Brew Built line of conical fermenters and all that. Um, More beer seems to have a lot of those going on. Yeah. Uh, Adam Chumbly. Also, this friend of mine needed uh, 325 billion cells for a 1.072 OG beer and pitched an Omega proper starter can on top of an Imperial 200 bill cell count pitch. Wasn't necessary. It ripped through in two days. Well, I mean, depending on what yeast that is, it's not uncommon because Quike, you could throw like, I don't know, a teaspoon in there and it'll rip through in two days. Just a spoonful of Quike! makes the yeast or sugars go away all right uh was it necessary i mean probably not in all honesty but was it fun was it fun yeah <laughs> uh it, you know at that point you probably are over pitching uh and you'll find out if you get some off flavors from over pitching yeah it's really hard to get off flavors from over, over pitching i'd rather err on that side than the other side yeah. Um, let's get back to the, let's, let's, let's start on top on the topic. Uh, topic number two. Right, um, we're almost thank you everyone for the questions. Uh, I'm sorry that that took such a long intermission before getting to the topic and hopefully we'll have time to, yeah, we'll have time to get through it. Yeah, we definitely do. We've got a half hour. All right. Topic one, number one, how to add German influence to your beers. This at, may or may not have come in, uh, in, in the wake of no drought, just opening. Yeah. Um, and again, something that we've been thinking about quite a bit, uh, in especially, especially because a lot of, uh, German craft I, mean, I don't know if they have a, in particular craft beer scene but you know they, their beers have been starting to take an American influence mm -hmm. with something like German IPA and that's actually a thing I mean as a style I don't know if that's BJCP is going to add that but no, I don't think so if you want to uh, know what that tastes like go drink Progusta because that is a great uh, example of uh, Germans taking on uh, newer styles and adding their influence to it. Yeah, it's happening all over there. Uh, I would say Hoblenschuf, Schaff, Hoblenschuf, the gnome little beer too. That's a, uh, I mean that's not anywhere new, but it's a really fantastic uh, Belgian, um, Belgian IPA that you should try. Yeah, Hoblenschuf, Hoblenschaf, Hoblenschuf. Yeah, uh, actually that's <coughs> one of uh, Weiss and the uh, Imperial's yeast strains. Yeah, gnome, yeah. gnome, and that's oh that's Ardenne. their Dan strain. Yeah. Anyways, let's, uh, right, uh, let's so how to add uh, German, German influence to your beer. Uh, the number one thing that I would say if most people are trying to get that German classic flavor is going to be water chem. Uh, if you are anywhere in the vicinity of Spokane, where we are, uh, the majority of people, for whatever reason, we're really lucky here not to have this, but the majority of people in the area mm -hmm. have relatively hard water uh, that you know comes out of the tap at you know a, a pH of 8, uh, usually has an overall hardness of somewhere between 120 and 150 uh, bicarbonate carbonate load is high, calcium load is relatively high, and for whatever reason, um, sodium, sulfate, chloride, all that is relatively low. So we can start from scratch when it comes to chloride to sulfate ratios, for example, um, but just the overall hardness is going to make our beer rockier and uh, more um, suited for English if we add some sulfate styles than it is German. So starting with a neutral base, relatively low mineral load, and one of the things that is indicative of a lot of German styles, not all, but a lot of German styles, is a small amount of sodium. 
So a lot of people, when they're doing their water cam, they don't even think about sodium as an addition, uh, but sodium actually helps build body and fullness. So you can have a dry beer that uh, appears more malty sweet, appears more rich and feels uh, softer to the palate uh, by using sodium chloride instead of calcium chloride. Yeah, uh, and this is one of those things that we're always <laughs> preaching proper water cam. Uh, again, we're preaching proper water cam here, but it's just taking it in a different way. It's instead of matching your water cams to whatever style you're doing, it's matching your water cams to a, in particular region that you're trying to mimic if they were doing other styles. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's gonna be very important in this. It, it's one of the reasons that Progusta as an IPA is really smooth and delicious is because of that water chem there. The softer water is smoothing out the hops in it and making it a creamier, more delicious beer to drink. Yeah. Uh, also, that same kind of water uh, style is something that I think is indicative of our Castor Muncher. It's something we even throw in the kits. Um, and it's uh, a little bit of a sodium load is also something that we use uh, in our hazies too, just to add some fullness. Yeah. Uh, and it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, Jimmy J uh, has a comment on that. German hazy with mandrina, mandrina Bavaria, Hill Melon, Hellertau Blanc, Wheat Beer Gris, Kolsch yeast. How about that for a German IPA? It's it's a little bit different. You, uh, it's on a good path, but this is one of those things that you have to think about. If you just do it with your home water, you just made a hazy IPA that just has German hops in it, yeah. not a German hazy IPA. Also, I think because so many German beers are typically lagered and stored, it's hard. It's gonna get the. It's gonna be hard to get the full sense of a of, of having that German influence, um, just with German hops and German ingredients, uh, because ha you know a hazy IPA and the vast majority of German styles uh, outside of like Keller beer are very very opposite uh, production methods. So yeah. I, I would I would more rely on like uh, on heavy dry hopping than I would a big whirlpool and try to do almost a German lager esque thing to to get that influence. Well, take those and don't do hazy IPA processes. <clears throat> do German hopping processes for it, and you're gonna catch more of it. Unless you're doing a Keller beer, but again, do a, do a Keller beer. Do the German processes in it, and do the German hopping processes in it. Not the uh, American hazy IPA hopping process. And you'll have a very much more German hazy IPA than hazy IPA with German hops. I can see the wheat beer base. Maybe if you're trying to do like a, uh, like a Hefeweizen IPA or something like, like that, like hop, an overly hopped hop Hefeweizen, yeah. I could see that. But I think the yeast would need to play a role in that too. So you'd have to have some of that isoamyl acetate, that banana ester um, uh, be, be part of the part mix. Of Maybe Bonanza? Bonanza would be actually phenomenal for that. Yeah. But I think in Bonanza, you're missing you're missing some of the phenols in it. It's, again, one of those things where you made a hazy IPA with German ingredients rather than a German hazy IPA. And I, I'm nitpicking this. It, it, it's a point where it's, it's kind of hard to do it. But this also brings us into our second part of this top, uh, topic is what you're also using in it, the, uh, your malt selections for this. As we were talking about earlier, Great Western uh, Vienna malt is gonna be way different than Best Malt's Vienna malt, the German uh, Vienna malt there. And that's <laughs> something that can take you into being more, uh, more authentic. Or, um, ah, gosh, I don't really know how to say that really well. Uh, that's but. a stumpy one. I think that water, with water cam and if you made it like a, like a Hefeweizen, I think probably some of the yeast selection, I think it's doable. I think it might be a good idea, but it's hard to wrap my head around. Ledgerill89, yeah. thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, putting this on my tab for when I'm in Washington in a few months. Well, we hope to see you in a few months. Yeah, good. Uh, um, definitely. So w back to the malt selection, though, what we're ta talking about when it comes to, uh, let's say, you know, Great Western's v uh, Vienna malt versus Best Malt, which is the German Vienna malt, uh, or, or Weiermann, or some of those other uh, German-influenced uh, malts. There is a, uh, pr a, a distinct graininess that comes out of using German malt selection. Uh, it's why we use, uh, you know, Pilsner malt that's usually German. Like, we don't even usually stock American Pilsner malt because German Pilsner malt has a distinct character that is – uh, going to be indicative of most beer, res you know, recipes that you have Pilsner malt in. 
Uh, yeah. we, we're not just going for American light lager lightness. We're going for a little bit of graininess that kind of builds character on top of those. When it comes down to that being darkened a little bit in the malting process for your Munichs and your Vienna, that graininess still carries through, and that has to do with the proteins uh, structures of the grain, um, how they are grown and how they are bred uh, to, uh, you know, honestly be a little bit more of a, a of a older heritage. They have different proteins in them um, that uh, carry through in the final flavor and add some what I call all graininess in the beer now yeah, uh, along with the roast or uh, the malting houses are different uh, it, while most <clears throat> of the process is basically the same you know they may be doing it just in little bits of slight differences the terrier of the region that we don't normally think about but the soil that it's growing in will make that grain taste different a little bit and that is something that is big into this switching over into an actual and you can get some of this uh from locally placed uh or locally sourced uh farms and maltsters link uh here in spokane actually has some really amazing ones that you couldn't tell the difference that they were grown you know a couple of hundred miles down in the farmland here to germany but you're going to have to go to that, get the actual appropriate malts for that. When you're using a German base malt in this, it tastes different than if you're using uh, the American grown equivalent. And it's, it's a hard flavor to pin down, but it's there and it makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, let's go on to why I think a, a, a German influenced hazy is kind of an oxymoron. Uh, and that has to do with one of the best ways to get that German influence feel uh, in any of your beers is to simplify the recipe and add processes to make that beer more complex. So that's going to go along with uh, doing a decoction. That's going to go along with um, doing, you know, long boil times, doing step mashes. Uh, a lot of beers, uh, a lot of beers that come from that traditional German influence came before thermometers were really used, which means that the best way to get full conversion out of your grains was to actually ramp up through all the different mash steps and just make sure that you hit everything, which means that those proteins are going to break down uh, more consistently, even when it, with a heavy wheat beer load. Uh, you're going to get more of that Maillard. You're going to get more character development. Um, a simple, you know, Pilsner malt and wheat base can turn into a really complex beer uh, with a very full, subtle nut nuttiness um, just by doing that ramped mash. If you start with a, you know, a, a rest all the way down in the phytic to ferulic acid range and you're ramping that all the way up, or even if you start at room temperature and then slowly ramp the temperature up all the way to your mash out uh, and then uh, and then lauder then you're going to get a, a, a wide range of character development that um, is going to um, go through a protein rest so it's going to break down beta glucans it's going to break down proteins and that is uh, even in wheat beers it's going to be kind of the opposite of what we do when we're trying to make a I mean typical Americanized hazy easy. so uh, what I think I hear you saying is you should perfect your process yeah and that's something that's huge in German beers is the perfection of process. Yeah. Simplify your recipe. You, nocturnal. Simplify your recipes. Um, and that's something we actually preach on the channel a lot is simplifying your recipes in general. Because um, with simple recipes, you are forced to be a better brewer. And then if you want to get crazy with recipes down the road, you've got all the tools in your toolkit to do so. Um, so malt selection and then adding processes, even something as simple as doing a protein rest before going into a uh, step mash can give you that cleanness not necessarily uh, always crystal clear cleanness um, for example with uh, w what Jimmy was saying with using a, a, a wheat beer base and a hazy um, uh, but that is going to give you a specific cleanness um, you know in any style even if it has uh, a little bit of haze to it in the style um, and lastly the I mean this one might be pretty obvious but going into yeast selection yeast selection is probably the easiest way to get that German feel um, and one of my favorite yeasts to use of all time is uh, 3470 the fine Stefan lager strain and despite you know if it's lagered properly being a very clean yeast there is a subtle esterification like we were talking about when we were breaking down the Dunkel Dunkelsbach Dunkelsbach Dunkel. not very good at uh, pronouncing German things um, there is a subtle uh, uh, malt leaning esterification that I think helps round out a lot of these styles. So regardless of what you're making, if you're making a German IPA, a German hazy, uh, which I think would be really good if you did it with a fine Stefan wheat strain, uh, mm -hmm. that's going to be like a German, it's going to be like a hefty hazy. I think I would cooler ferment <clears throat> it though, keep the phenols down, 
but still catch some of it. But regardless, a little bit of that isoamyl acetate flavor is going to remind you uh, of, of that German influence, especially if you're already nailing the most important thing, which is that water chem. Uh, and then you're picking those German malts that have that little bit of extra graininess. Uh, and then if you're adding all the processed stuff that we've talked about, I think that's going to that's gonna do it. Adam Chumbly, contributing to Ledrill 89 Stab. Thank you so much for the super chat. Pretty appreciate it, Adam. So I uh, knock, knock, turn all. We need to bring back the bingo link. Yeah, I know. Uh, we de definitely do. Nocturnal Brewer was mad that we didn't have any tastings. Peter hasn't got to taste this yet. Uh, this is a 9% mead that was stopped a little bit sweet, fermented with Lutra Quike. Hmm. Uh, a couple of guys that uh, came in. They're the guys we need to talk about, see if we can get it, uh, an account with Dutch Gold Honey. Okay. So we can get some bulk honeys. Uh, and then I can make a beer to mouth. Anyway. Um, yeah. This is fantastic. Uh, I will tell you, if you're a mead maker out there, definitely play around with some quike because this is oh, incredible. That's, that's pleasant. It's it's a little. It finishes a little bit sweet, and that was intentional for them uh, yeah. there. I had some of it before, uh, but at the same time, this is so clean and amazingly clean. You can just taste all of the fermentation, all of the honey in there, all of its complexity. It's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely awesome. Play with quike and mead, please, please. Jeff Harrington, I've never watched live before. I feel vulnerable. Well, we appreciate that about you. That is what we appreciate about you. Uh, Frazzle Penguin, I brewed a Belgian Golden Strong for the first time with YH1388. Fruity with medium body <laughs> despite finishing at 1.006. Moderately hazy. Should I find it? Would that kill the fruitiness? Uh, I mean, I would not find it personally, but I, you know, with, any, with a Belgian um, Strong, you're just going to give it time, and that should find eventually regardless. Yeah. Part of the fruity fullness probably comes, you know, not just from the yeast acidification, uh, but that might be one of the yeast that produces glycerins and fermentation to give it the perception of fullness, despite, I believe that's a diastatic strain. 1388. Yeah. Um, I think so, too. Someone can fact check me if they care to, but. Uh, yeah. Lou, Ledger 89's got a good question. In a brewery setting, do you use RO slash distilled water on a big scale? Uh, and that, the answer to that is sort of. Um, it depends on where you're from. There's a lot of breweries in... What's that? I'm more of the same. No, no. This is mango habanero. Ooh, nice. That'll be a fun blend. Um, there's a lot of breweries in Spokane that don't because Spokane has good water. That said, on average, Spokane water is meant for, you know, really great ambers, really great porters, um, and can lean a lot into English styles. Uh, at the Steel Barrel downtown, we do have a giant filter, but it's a basic filter. It's not a true RO. Um, but if you go to... Uh, Arizona, for example, uh, most of the breweries there will use uh, have a giant RO filter, and they will use 100% RO water. Uh, you basically, how do you do that in a brewery setting? You get one big enough. Uh, one of the easiest ways to store that uh, or make it more effective for you is to have the uh, RO or distilled feature hooked up to a oversized HLT tank or hot liquor tank, hot water tank whatever you want to call it yeah right yeah yeah that is exactly how you want to drink that's our mango habanero seltzer and the sweetness of this meat is just stupidly perfect for it that'll do it oh my god yeah um so that's uh, hook it up to an oversized hlt tank and then just always keep that sucker full and that's how you do it hlt tank by the way is redundant yeah i know <laughs> but that's what I said. Uh, and a good actual thing about that is because there's nothing in it, no minerals or anything like that, you're not going to have buildup and scales and stuff like you would normally. So. Yeah, so then you don't have to you know, run acid through it every three months. Mm -hmm. By the way, we should run acid through that. We should run acid through it. And it, I know, we just need to take a week and just like... Do everything that we're supposed everything. to do that we've been putting off. Yeah, I know. Lars, how long is the maximum it should take for a yeast to get going to be doing my first non-quike brew? Wow, all your brews up to tell them have been quite. That's kind of cool, actually. Um, yeah. And getting worried because it's been 18 hours. Uh, depends on the style. If it's a lager or anything similar, if it's cold or fermented, you might not see activity, even if it's already happening. Um, if it's a warm beer, and depending on if you did a starter or what you did to take care of yeast, there's a chance it can take longer than that. I've seen you know beers take two plus days before you see any visible activity. Usually it's associated with either um, osmotic stress from it being a high ABV beer, a big beer, 
or it's to do with really, really sleepy yeast that weren't properly uh, woken up uh, before going into your beer. So that's one of the reasons we always recommend a starter. Um, mm -hmm. But the only way to say whether or not you need to take action right now is if you take a gravity reading and it's not moving. Yeah. There are some that are really sleepy. Belle Saison is <clears throat> notorious for taking either a long time to start. I know well. I, oh, yeah. Well, hey. You, oh. I know well. My child's waving at me. And she gets frustrated if I don't respond soon enough. How, how we doing? You having fun with Grammy and Grampy? Okay. Uh, Belle Saison. <laughs> I will see you later. Uh, Bell Saison uh, actually is a notorious yeast for like falling asleep in the middle of your ferment and then waking back up a week later to ferment the crap out of it. Uh, there are some yeasts that do that. Uh, ESB yeast is n not for known for starting slow, but for ending abruptly before it has fermented the beer all the way out. Uh, temperature can help a lot, so do some temperature ramping. Uh, it's going to depend on the flavor you want, so, but temperature ramping can be helpful, uh, as well as rousing, uh, or if you're only 18 hours in, it's actually not too late to put more pure oxygen into your beer, so if you want to throw an oxygen stone in there um, and use that to both rouse your yeast and help, help make some more yeast, that is totally still doable. Yeah. Uh, all right, Nocturnal Brew. I might have skipped a couple. Oh, Jimmy J, actually, that's a good one. Is there a calculator program to help cut your strike water up into smaller amounts where you add boiling water to raise multiple attempts for rest, or you get closer, or would you just add more water to get closer to a full volume mash? Uh, you can solve this problem by doing a decoction mash and then just, you know, pull it out of uh, your mash tun and boil that. I, what? I believe there is that exact calculator on Brewer's Friend, uh, but I also don't think it's terrible math to do by yourself also. Um, you just got to be, you, you got to know your mash done and how comfortable you are with a thicker starting mash, if that's what you're going for. But yeah, decoction yeah. Uh, or just some sort of our herms or rim system is probably the easier way to do steps, but... Yeah, uh, well, it, like Peter said, there's that calculator on Brewer's Friend if you want to look that up, and away you go on that. So there we go. Uh, here's one. Nocturnal Brewer. A brewed and almost smashed with golden plum ski, golden bramas, citra and lemon drops. It has a bready flavor. Is that normal for that grain? Um, mm, Depends I, on what you mean by bready, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's a nutty. A golden promise is like, uh, it's like a specific varietal of Maris Otter. Um, and it's, it's brewed to just a, or it's malted to just a slightly, you know, nuttier pale ale esque uh, malt range so it's going to have some character for sure uh if it's br if it's astringent bready then something probably went wrong but if it's not astringent it doesn't make you like want to peel your tongue a little bit then uh, that's probably appropriate and just what that malt tastes like when you say bready my immediate thought goes to yeast <clears throat> most of the time when i in particular run into bready flavor like bread bready flavors that uh, aren't style appropriate i get that a lot from yeast especially so4 or just british ale yeast a lot of british yeast give me that kind of like yeah this is like dough uh flavor to it um but it could be send us some and then we'll tell you uh brett and leo i met a few meads and sizers with Vosquike, and interestingly it finished sweeter for example 1020 uh, for a 1.1 gravity um, than other ale strains that often go uh, go dry like wine yeast. That is mm. interesting. My thought would be it has to do with the nutrient load. That would also be my immediate thought. Quite or temperature. Uh, quikes mm. love to ferment really hot. They also need more oxygen and they need more nutrients than normal uh, beer yeast strains. Yeah. So, yeah. And they also can, uh, Voss specifically can also get sleepy at like normal room temperatures. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've actually run into that before. Uh, even in Lutra, um, when we fermented it at uh, lower ale temperatures, it's had a harder time finishing out uh, than when it does when it's hot. And that's normal for yeast. It likes to run hot and heavy. Hmm. Rohit Gund, is there any substitution for DAP? Not really. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 I mean, there's probably what, whatever they use in Fermate O for a, uh, organic source of nitrogen. Yeast. Yeah. Yeah. Dead, dead yeast. Dead cells. yeast. Uh, uh, well, I think that's what's in Fermate O for, 
for, uh, for, for the, the nitrogen, nitrogen mode. I mean, but the, the, there's uh, there's not a direct substitute because there's always going to be something that ha like everything else is going to have other things besides just the nitrogen load. They're going to have vitamins. They're going to have um, you know sometimes fats if it comes from Saccharomyces. Uh, there's other things that are always going to be in there. So there's not a direct substitute for DAP. No. Uh, not as readily, <clears throat> easily available for yeast to eat, uh, unless you're using some kind of, not nutrient, but other organic substance to achieve nit uh, nitrogens in there, like grains. Grain is, when you're doing a mash, you get almost all the nitrogen you need out of it from the grains. So doing something like that, good substitute for DAP. Uh, trying to substitute DAP out in, uh, you know, mead or uh, seltzer, things like that, where you're not getting it from a grain source, it's not going to be as easy or effective. There's probably a way to do it, but yeah, you I know. don't know it. Uh, if anybody out there is in the nutrient business and they got away, give us a contact and we'll make a video out of it. Uh, salad official, the only real salad, is Italian Pilsner with Pearl and Saphir. Oh, that's kind of fun. Um, 3470. I feel, I feel like Italian Pilsners usually are, you know, they're dry hopped with like prominent American hops though. Like, uh, well, that just might be the way that Americans are doing it. But I feel yeah. like when I actually drink like a Peroni, it's, it's got classic. It's more classic. Yeah. yeah. German hops. Uh, anyways, uh, 3470 ideal fermentation temperature. Uh, I would probably start at like 58 to 60 and then do a, still do a temperature ramp or a slow VDK. I don't think there's a real reason with 3470 to, to ferment like at super cold i uh i would say on the low end the lowest i would probably start out is like 56 maybe um again big starter but uh 3470 should be a beast and it's really really clean even at cold at you know semi-warm relative temperatures so i yeah. would yeah i would i would start it on warmer than you would normally start other lager yeasts speaking of uh, italian when i was in france i tried to climb a really tall tower but i fell off nah uh, yeah, great puns. Uh, it's not even time to be... Oh, oh that's Harry. Who cares? Um, uh, where is... There was somebody under that. That um, Oh, Lars. He asked the question about it taking too long. Uh, he says he's using Verdant Dry Pack. And in all honesty, the way that I've seen Verdant react, that's a little more concerning than I thought it was without knowing the yeast. Uh, Verdant. Verdant from Lalamond uh, is an incredible hazy IPA, English style yeast. I love that. Goes into all of our hazies and juicies. That is an aggressive, aggressive yeast. Generally, for me, it's always been started up right away and it's always fermented out sooner rather than later. I mean, I get like five day ferments out of Verdant. So take your gravity readings definitely 100 percent. really look at that you might need to pitch some more yeast uh the only real salad have you ever used erasia malts no no uh, <clears throat> if you have a good link on those send it to us that, yeah, we'll try them out yeah that sounds interesting uh daniel of all the arcs to play uh, in the background you chose spider ants i just would whatever it was on and they're the, chimera ants not spider ants yeah i know spider ants also it, it, to me just saying the most overrated arc of all time I don't get why so many people love the Chimera Ant arc. It just doesn't like it's 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 a good arc by itself. If it was a standalone series, I'd get it, but it's not. It's Hunter X Hunter, and it completely throws off the the vibe of the entire show. In my humble opinion, which is correct all the time, it's it's very incongruent with the rest of the arcs. One hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, it's I want like, Gon to be a happy little kid that also like has that sense of justice. I don't want Gon to be like this, you know hateful weird turns into a man to kick some butt dude and uh it's like when you know when you're watching bleach and you're really getting into it and you're like ah oh, eisen's getting away and finally we're gonna have some good fights and then all of a sudden you see some stupid bounce like that could have been great as its own own series and not not in the middle of all of the action <clears throat> dang it is that the word for vampires um that's the vampire arc in yeah. bleach yeah bounce all right i'm going old school hey harry uh, Matthew Lopez, can you guys put ten pounds of uh, put ten pound bags of Halcyon and Special X on your web store? Probably. 
I feel like we'd have to overcharge for them. I'll, we'll figure out what more beer charges for them. But more beer, if you get enough, to do free shipping, and we don't have we don't ship out enough to have, have good free, free shipping. shipping. So the reason we don't do a lot of that stuff is I feel like we'd have to overcharge for it to be worth it. Yeah, but probably. Uh, that's the deal about most of that, especially sending things out. It's not necessarily like we don't want to do it. Uh, we're happy to take your money for it. It just usually ends up being much more expensive than we feel comfortable with. It makes us feel bad to charge you that much to do some of these things. Because we like to be price competitive and not rip people off. I want to brew a beer now to age and give us Christmas gifts next year. I'm open to all styles. Any suggestions? Oh, yeah. Barley wine. Uh, English, lambic. Um, American barley wine. Oh, well, lambic would probably work. Uh, most of the Belgian strongs. So it's golden strong, strong darks, regular strong, trappist. If, if you started like a, a, a lambic, like a cherry lambic right now, Ooh, yeah. and then spruced it going into oh. uh, like when you package it next year, I think that could be <laughs> that could be the way to go. That could be. Or uh, draw a penis. <laughs> you did without even without even any provocation. All right, uh, yeah, spruce or rosemary. I would that would be great with some rosemary too. Yeah, like, that'd be fun. That sounds delicious. Uh, uh, Bill Davenport is going to try to try a decoction, and we appreciate you for that. We do. It's we a good do. thing to do. Verdant, so good. Uh, Steph, will you be joining the Hoppy Hour as a guest in the new year? Uh, cheers, mandatory beer chug. I don't have beer, and also I'm very hungover, so that'd be a I can do more, uh, this I can is do like ten percent, so I will give it my go. Um, I'll drink it swiftly. It's been a while since I've been on the Hoppy Hour. The reason being, I got really busy. Yeah, I got a lot. Of, I got a lot of random stuff going on, and then between kids and coaching and all my stuff, both here and at the Steel Barrel, it's been rough. Uh, but I like CH. Yeah. And would like to be on his channel again soon. I like this one. Patrick Sandy, Earthbound again. Thoughts on using yeast strains on recipes they are not traditionally used for. In the name of science, we do that all the damn time. And in fact, you can make some incredible beers about it. Going back uh, two Sundays ago, uh, we act, or maybe two Sundays, maybe more, we talked about doing some winter beers. And uh, we put... Yeah. Uh, we put a... Uh, German Hefeweizen strain into a American amber and it turned into just a beautiful beautiful winter beer it was spicy a little clovey you wanted to drink it on the mountain you know in the clubhouse is that what they call them clubhouse I don't know I haven't I haven't I might need your keys to let her in yeah I'm gonna try to see if this one works oh I think we got two new quote unquote blue ones um yeah, do it. You can make some absolutely incredible flavors by doing that. Just when you do it, try to think about what you're trying to achieve flavor-wise in the beer and flavor-wise from the yeast and what you're trying to get out of it so you know you don't make something that's just weird and undrinkable. But definitely, we support it 100%. Unbreakable. Survive the devil. It's a miracle. Yeast and the beast. 3470 under pressure at 65 degrees F. I think he's in response to somebody doing 3470. Um, oh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, up there. My only problem with that is it's not four degrees higher. Yeah, and that's a problem. Yep. Uh, uh, plan on making a pre prohibition pilsner using six row rice, nugget, and diamond lager. Thoughts? Yeah. Uh, six. Um, or if you have a high high protein like no low like under modified pilsner malt, you can get some of the same characters. Mm -hmm. Six row, it's it works. Of, don't get me wrong. Yeah, it's, well, it's fine. Kind of one of those things that uh, most of the industry has fallen victim to. As in, we've gotten better at doing things, uh, we've made better products, and that's lost some flavors that were traditionally in things. We're making six, we're figuring out how to grow it better, make a better yield come off of it and all of those things. But that means that you're missing some of those other more grainy, proteiny flavors because that's not good for making beer or shine or anything like that. Uh, so to achieve those flavors, using something a little bit different might give you a better result, but it sounds like a fine recipe. Yeah. I definitely uh, would I just make have, it. I, I, have, I have a little bit of a, of, a, of a high horse on six row just because a lot of people will 
don't understand what happened to Six Row specifically, you know, with uh, especially since the ni- late 1980s and early 1990s and why Six Row basically doesn't exist in the brewing world anymore. And they don't, and yeah. that Six Row isn't what Six Row was pre-prohibition timeline. So the Six Row that you can get is not the same Six Row. It It's a real big danger <clears throat> of reading some of these. Uh, oh, we're super choppy right now. Uh, it's a real big danger of using some historical things is that you need to use historical ingredients too. Uh, nugget, awesome. Diamond lager yeast, awesome. Uh, if you do a starter, big pitch. Um, six row is totally fine. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to say your recipe is bad at all, uh, but I just I have a high horse on that. Um, do an acid rest too if you're not going to add any acid malt. Definitely. Uh, Bill Davenport, you actually, we never even mentioned this. Uh, Dap, had to Google it, learn something new. For those of you in uh, podcast land, thanks for not Googling it yet. Dap is diammonium phosphate. Uh, it's basically one of the best forms. And sorry if you can't hear it. Uh, we're trying to work on the audio problem, apparently. Um, Oh. oh, people just reloaded and it was fixed. Yeah. DAP, uh, diammonium phosphate, it is an inorganic nitrogen source used to be yeast food. Yeah, basically. Exactly that. Oh, uh, Matthew Lopez, if uh, your local home, you asked us to send you something, I think. Uh, can you guys put, that? oh, he's asking for Halcyon and Special X. Uh, it, and oh, his yeah. local homebrew store doesn't carry it. Uh, again, uh, send us a Facebook <clears throat> message about that. That way we don't forget it. Yeah, we can probably help take care of it. Riv Riv, Rivera, same kind of thing. More beer doesn't carry Halcyon malt. They should. They had it for the longest time, and then they ran – because they got it when uh, they wholesaled out all of Great Western's old stuff. Um, and I guess they, they don't anymore. I will call them and yell at them and make them carry it. Yeah, because everyone should because we said so. <laughs> Uh, we uh, were talking to the uh, the rep at uh, More Beer actually, and he, um, when they first ran out of Halcyon, Halcyon, like I don't know, this is probably five months ago or something like that. He, uh, he blamed said us. It, yeah, he blamed us. He said it was our fault. Which I mean, we'll take full responsibility for making people's beer better. Yep, <laughs> that's that's something we do. Uh, Ooh, John Dieter, thanks guys. I like the cherry lambic idea. I'll send you one next year. Woo, that sounds awesome. Oh. Uh, sorry for the third update, Lars. Okay, good. <laughs> Just found out the uh, Kegamenter CO2 relief valve was unscrewed, fixed it, and blow off is going strong. Nice, dude. That makes me feel good because that that was scary with Veridin. That's that's an aggressive yeast. It's what great, are your thoughts though. on Quike Ragnarok? Um, I don't know. The, the Jimmy actually might know more about that than me. He's looked into a lot more Quikes than we have. We we have the Quikes that we know. Is that the new? Is that Ah, uh, I do remember. I think we, ta- we somebody mentioned this, and I googled it like four live streams ago or five live streams ago, and I totally forgot what it is. Um, that's where you put all the quike strains into one beer, and then the one that ferments it out wins. That's a good a good idea. And then has the power of thunder. Well, no, it has the power of like everything because Ragnarok is where you destroy everything. Like Thor, Thor would be dead at that point. Fair enough. In the real, it depends on which Ragnarok, Ragnarok you're talking about. I mean, in the real Norse one, it's like the end of all ends. End of days. Everyone yeah. give this this video a like real quick. Uh, we're going to start working on closing out unless there's any more pressing questions. Uh, appreciate you all being here. I uh, appreciate everyone for the, that super chatted us. Thank you uh, so much to those guys who super chatted us and support the channel. Um, it helps us do cool things like buy new uh, XLR cables that make our audio sound way better and give Harry an easier job putting this out into podcast land. Yeah, it makes so. it so you can like hear us, and you know, also makes it do do things like be here. And you know what they say, hearing is shearing. Yeah, and we need more beer. Send us more beer. Always. All right, love you guys. I'm going to go work on closing. Oh, Harry's over there. Harry's going to work on closing it out. Um, So we are just going to ramble and tell you to do all the things while he's working on closing it out. We might cut out in the middle of a sentence. And also send us things like Acer Glisten. (laughs)